Hello, I'm your host, Sam Knowles. Welcome to this end of season wrap up for Data Malarkey, the podcast about using data smarter. It's been six months since our first episode, and in the past three months, the number of listeners to the podcast, not to mention viewers on our YouTube channel at Data Malarkey, has really exploded. We're well into five figures, meaning tens of thousands of streams, downloads, subscriptions, and views. Thanks to everybody who's listened to, shared, commented on, and joined the growing army of Data Malarkey fans. You know, we've been on a bit of a world tour for season two, from North America to Germany, from Israel to France, Netherlands to the UK. We've welcomed academics, business leaders, data scientists, and bloggers. And what unites all of them is that, in their respective and very different fields, they all make genuinely smarter use of data. My role as host, particularly in end of season wrap up episodes like this one, is to join the dots, align the planets, and bring together learnings from our disparate world leaders and leading thinkers in how to use data smarter. Season two opened with an absolute blockbuster of a guest. Steven Pinker is one of the world's leading public intellectuals and best-selling authors. I think he'd be a top three in many people's lists, and in mine, I'd say he's number one. The Harvard psychology professor gave a brilliant introduction and description to one of those biggest stumbling blocks in data storytelling, the curse of knowledge. I mentioned that I'm a big fan of the sense of style. Um, and you do, you do you devote a whole chapter to the curse of knowledge, uh, which I think is is uh, and you and you point the finger at uh, at academics and financial advisors and lawyers and the rest of it. Um, for our listeners not familiar with the phenomenon, could you um, describe it? And could you maybe talk about um, the connection between the curse of knowledge and when people? maybe particularly some academics, use too much data. Yes, right. So the curse of knowledge is a psychological phenomenon uh, in which uh, once you know something, it's extraordinarily difficult to imagine what it's like not to know it. Uh, that is, to uh, project yourself into the minds of other people who don't know what you know, even to remember back to before you knew it. Uh, people think that if you know it now, you always knew it. And the classic demonstration comes from uh, an experiment with children. In, in the case of um, uh, cognitive development, the same phenomenon is sometimes called uh, lack of a theory of mind uh, or mentalizing. The theory here, not referring to a scientific theory, but to kind of our own, everyone's folk theory. So the classic stu study is you, um, you take a three-year-old, you play a little, a little scenario, um, you take a marble that was in a basket and you put it in the box. And the child sees it, they knows, the child knows where the marble is. And you say, um, well, uh, sorry, Sally, see, Sally, a puppet, sees the marble in the basket. Sally leaves the room. You put the marble from the basket into the box. Sally comes back into the room. Where will Sally look for the marble? And kids will say, in the box. Now, the child knows that the marble was put in the box, but Sally wasn't in the room when that happened. Sally has no way of knowing uh, that the marble was in the box. The child just instinctively assumes that what he himself knows, everyone else knows, and gives the wrong answer about Sally. And by four years old, four years of age, most kids um, solve the problem. They know that what they know and what Sally knows are different. Still, it's uh, it still afflicts us as adults. And uh, I, I think the main explanation for why academic writing is so dreadful is not the common conspiracy theory. Academics, they try to sound highfalutin. They're trying to bamboozle people because they have nothing to say with all this highfalutin jargon uh, to make up for the fact that they're spouting banalities. I actually don't think that's the, the best explanation because I know a lot of brilliant scholars who um, really do have something to say, but they just can't say it. And the reason they can't say it is they don't know that their entire autobiography, you know, umpteen years of graduate school and postdoc and being a professor, and they've amassed all of this technical vocabulary, all of these paradigms and analytic techniques, each one of which they can identify with a label. And they think that everyone knows those labels. And uh, they, it doesn't occur to them that their audience has a live the lives that, that they have lived. And a lot of it is completely needless. So in, in 
uh, you know, in, in neuroscience, uh, there's absolutely no precision to be gained in talking about a murine model as opposed to a mouse. Um, and or for something like in, in plant biology, Arabidopsis, if you just say, you know, uh, in parentheses, a mustard plant, you know, you've sacrificed you know, a dozen keystrokes and, you know, that amount of screen space, and you've multiplied by several orders of magnitude the size of the audience that knows what you're talking about. So it's a bad trade-off to use abbreviations and uh, or to fail to give examples when doing so multiplies or maybe even exponentiates your your your, your readership, and also it's not just abbreviations because those are the easiest things to weed out, um, but also abstractions, uh, describing something in language of what it means to you, as opposed to the concrete goings on. So if I uh, I'm going to you know move my own field of of cognitive development or one of my fields, you say an age-appropriate uh, engaging stimulus uh, was used in uh, con condition one. Uh, if you just said a Mickey Mouse doll, uh, then people would be able to form an image and know what you're talking about. Age-appropriate, you know, developmentally appropriate stimulus, you know, what does that even mean? Uh, and there's a lot of scientific and academic talk which is couched in abstractions, and the human mind is best when it can visualize something. A Mickey Mouse doll is indeed very much easier to understand and visualize than an age-appropriate stimulus. Sam Michelson, CEO and founder of New York and Jerusalem-based digital reputation management business Five Blocks, also addressed the curse of knowledge when we spoke. In this snippet, Sam focuses on what we expect to see in data, on what's missing, and how the curse of knowledge can get in the way of making sense of what the data mean. I guess, I guess putting it all in front of you and then, and asking questions like, what would I expect to see? Why, uh, you know, asking the questions like, I, I like to, I've been doing this with chat GPT. It's a really interesting uh, exercise is that you, you take a story, a familiar story and say, okay, given the following story, but not knowing the ending chat GPT, tell me what would be the most likely endings I think that that's a fascinating uh, way of thinking, and I and, and I think that way about about uh, of a client situation. Say, okay, so let's say it makes sense that the client has for their employer brand that they have their main that their corporate website is at the top, and then that they have their employment website, their job, careers at company .com. Um, And then and then I ask, okay, well, what would I expect to see next? Well, I I like say, I guess I guess maybe the answer is what is missing? What is the thing? Uh, the most interesting thing on the Google results page is the thing that isn't there. The most interesting thing I think in life is the are, are the things that you don't that aren't there that are missing. Um, why you know it's why is no one doing this? Why is why is this so? When I look at a client situation, I guess what I'm thinking is what is missing here? What are, what is missing here? What would I have expected to see if I didn't know this? And and the, there's this curse of knowledge that when you see your situation, it's very hard to unsee the situation. But when you go in as a consultant. The first time you see it, if you're if you're smart, you can say, well, "What? Wait, what would I have expected to see?" Like, even I ask that question to myself. Um, you know, what what do I think I'll see? I do this when, if you look at a Wikipedia page, you can see how many um, how many people viewed every Wikipedia page. Um, it's it's information that's available uh, on every single day. So when I look at it, when someone says to me, "Oh, I have a Wikipedia page," I always ask myself, "I want I, I'm like I want to guess how many people go to this Wikipedia page a day." I think it's a hundred, and I, and I click in, and I, I have no way of knowing, and I and I, I can oftentimes I'm right, but uh, but sometimes I'm just so radically off, and that's so meaningful because if it's ten people a day, they're like, oh, okay, I have a completely, you know, I have to figure out why would only ten people a day go to this executive's Wikipedia page? Is it not showing up well? It's are they just don't care about them? If and then if you see that it's a thousand, you're like, wait, something else is going on here completely. There there's far more search than I thought. Maybe this site is coming up. So the same thing when when I look at it for insights, I'm thinking, what is missing here? What can I learn from what I don't see? And then and then start to work through. Okay, so why why am I seeing what I'm seeing? So it's kind of like question everything and keep thinking about what would the alternate endings and possibilities be. Um, and the most interesting insight we have for for uh, for brands, and this applies to so many different brands, is um, is why is it when I look at your Google results page, your brand, your consumer brand, or your B2B brand, and whenever anyone thinks about your brand or when they go to the website, they it invokes certain images. 
everybody, you're a luxury brand, so everybody's thinking about this luxurious experience that they're gonna have with your brand, right? But when I look at Google, there's no images and no video. That's like an insight that's that's like an instant insight. And every single person that you tell that to, when you said they're like, oh, wow. They can't see the thing that's not there. So I think um, that's an example. Um, and and I, th- I would say for every, the, the fun is that almost every time we have a client, it's different insight. Like there's certain common ones that we say, well, this is a little unusual that this that I'm seeing this, or I'm a little surprised that I see that, but I can usually figure out why that's there. Um, but then the real question is the re- the real question is what is what are the unique insights that I'm going to find here? And I I think it's just by it's a lot of curiosity and and uh, and questioning and analysis. The curse of knowledge, the difficulty in imagining what it's like not to know something that we do know, a real curse and a consequence of both a lack of em- empathy and a failure to understand one's audience. What's becoming increasingly clear is that people who work in and with data often don't speak the same language as the rest of the business or the organization. Elizabeth Press, creator and owner of the Berlin-based D3M Labs blog, that's the Data Driven Decision Making blog, was particularly eloquent on the lost in translation divide between data people and everybody else. Data leaders need business skills, and data people need to appreciate that data is a business function, not just a means of solving problems elegantly using Python or SQL. Here are three short clips from Elizabeth. So I think that data people, who are, this is this word, data people, we're a tribe unto ourselves when we talk about data and we love talking with each other and we find our, our profession interesting and fascinating and that's beautiful but what's not beautiful is that we don't communicate that well to the outside world and uh you know at 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 best we snob people at worst we're getting fired in mass and you know getting all of the social consequences that come from getting fired in mass and do you think that do you think so is that a consequence of data people and people who aren't data people in business kind of being separated by a common language they may speak technically the same language but actually uh, when it gets out nitty gritty they don't know what each other is talking about do you think it's a it's a communication fail yes i think it's a communication fail as well as a planning fail as well as an understanding that data is actually a business function and not a technical function fail. So I think actually that last part is probably the core of, of the sickness and everything else might be a little bit of the symptoms. And that's where there's a real lack of um, human centricity or empathy to people who are receiving that data and understanding the context. I could say it in many different ways, but in the end of the day, the truth is, is that many data people are so focused on the data that they're not understanding how that data is being used. And they're not even given the time to understand, just to be fair to those people, because they are working in very ad hoc environments, firefighting, under pressure. So they often don't have the time to reflect that their leaders aren't working in a space where they might be given the agency to say, hey, my team needs a little bit of time to plan and you know, go the extra mile to do this, the storytelling. So I think that there is a lot of um, investment or return on investment that is getting lost due to this adhocracy and lack of planning. And also maybe um, there's not investment on the part of the data teams or the companies in the data teams to to invest in people who are good at storytelling i think i i I think you prescribe it very well i i love the sound of an adhocracy i've not heard that as a as a as a word before i like it very much um yeah i mean i i mean i i spend a whole i spend a lot of time um as somebody who claims to be able to bridge both worlds who claims to be able to bridge both narrative and numbers stories and statistics um, to encourage people to be more human more empathetic to understand what the likely data tolerance kind of either up or down different from one's own is when when having wrangled some data just thinking about as a data leader 
Um, what do you think are the biggest impediments in moving from kind of so what to now what, in moving from this is what the data mean to this is what the business should do as a result? Are they, are they, is it common failings? Is it, is it the not speaking the same language? Or are there other things that get in the way of moving from data to insight and action? I think it's a complex issue. Um, but some of the main drivers are, I think, lack of business understanding on the data side. That you, one hires, or not one, let's say a lot of people hire people who could program and for, for to be data analysts. And you go to any of these data analyst courses and they're actually computer courses. They will teach the Python code to do churn analysis, but that's not business. That's um, understanding cookbook Python code. And I don't want to down it in any way, but it's not business. And this really, it gets under my skin in a way that it's like a cookbook code. And, um, you know, this is, it is challenging to do this in a, in a, in a good way and also in a high pressured environment. But if that is the focus of what a data analyst is, then we're losing something here. And that's really the problem is that these data analysts are supposed to be translating data into sense for business and, and insight. And people are um, spending their time doing code or fixing code or trying to learn how to code and looking on the internet and, and sort of even doing bad code. I'm sorry, but it's sort of the case. And then fixing that bad code and they're not doing the insight. So it's it's this sort of vicious cycle and people don't want to break out of that because there, there might be some sort of intellectual curiosity or technical purity, you know, to do something difficult and master it. But that's not adding value to the business to, 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 to work like that. Um, and, you know, we need to get people who are business people, I think, people who've studied business, who understand business and enable them to use low code, no code tools actually to, to do that analysis. I think that that's the best way forward. And instead of teaching people some cookbook code, get those people who have a business education and teach them to use the low code, no code tools, teach them about data and how data goes from in, you know, ingestion into the company and, and goes through, you know, the different stages to the decision making, teach them that and teach them how to create, to create um, their analysis using human understandable, you know, natural language tools. There's a lot of that coming into the market. So I think that that's the way forward. Elizabeth Press there, neatly summarising the challenges presented by data people not speaking the same language and both the acute and the chronic need for simultaneous translation tools between them and the rest of the business. The failure to connect presents real impediments in moving from data to insight and on to strategic implementation. The sudden appearance and mass availability of AI tools cannot have escaped anybody's notice over the course of the past year. In our conversation, Jean-Baptiste Bouzige, the founder and CEO of Paris headquarters AI and analytics firm Equimetrics, was happy both to dismiss the fool's goal of, of the metaverse and to exude a palpable sense of excitement about both the prospects for and the current realities of AI. Do you feel excited? Do you feel nervous or threatened? How do you feel about the sudden emergence of AI tools into the hands of everyone from ChatGBT and Bard and Bing and the rest of it, um, and many, many more besides? Does it, does it make your job easier or harder uh, with all of this, uh, these tools suddenly available to everybody for $20 a month? We'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited because uh, it's... Uh... As I've told you, it's it's so it's always exciting to 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 make your vision evolve and always stay loyal to your convictions and and loyal to to your will to create value for your clients. Um, I'm pretty uh, I'm not nervous about it because for me, so it's a true revolution. 
Uh, and you see that uh, we are entering the age of uh, AI. Uh, Bill Gates is, was saying that we, the age of AI has begun, and that's the uh, biggest revolution since uh, 1980. So I'm born in 1980, so it's uh, <laughs> it's funny to be part of it, you know. Um, and uh, and I feel w- what is exciting is that first, instead of talking, I'm more than happy to have this as a, as the buzz compared to the buzz on metaverse. And more than happy is that then we talk really about it. Um, uh, we see that uh, for for not the first time, but it's it's one of the first times where in the promotion of a new tech we talk a lot about the limits. Uh, often, you know, in uh, especially in the in the marketing tech world. Uh, you have this habit of thinking that the last solution is is the new magic and th- that it will solve all your all your problem. But here you had a lot of education and articles about the limitations, allowing us to explain how you create value, how do, how do you overcome this kind of limitation? Because you need to master what you do, you need to uh, to be able to explain the result of an algorithm. Uh, you need uh, uh, to be uh, really relevant. So really we have, it gives us a, a ground to explain the way we differentiate. While in the past, uh, often it was difficult to basically fight against promises. So I find it uh, useful for that. Uh, and and um, no, and, and then for our, our own work, uh, it will, it, it's exciting because especially it's funny because where we see uh, a gap change is uh, behind the scenes. I think for for data creation, data labelization, that's really a revolution in our practice. For on the front end, uh, it's really useful uh, when you have a, a human machine interface for conversation, etc. But it's not so you have a limited uh, set of usages, but for all the creation of data, labelization, etc., it's huge because it's it allows us to unlock a lot of things. Um, so I'm, no, I'm I'm excited because um, it's uh, and and we see that we we have just published something uh, where we use ChatGPT or we use that kind of technology uh, for a climate Q and A, so around the IPCC report. And we see the buzz. It's 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 beyond what we what, what we were thinking, because people seeing that we're able to do something that is curated, sourced, with this kind of technology, they say, "Oh, how is it possible? Oh, uh, finally we find something uh, positive about this uh, a positive usage of this kind of technology." Can you can you explain us how how you do that? And then we explain this question of breaking down the production line. In putting ChatGPT only at the place where we think it brings maximum value, but doing a lot of work before and after, so that it's source that we have no hallucination, etc. So that's a way to promote uh, our good uh, usage of data. So I like it. <laughs> Steve Pinker, I think it's fair to say, expressed rather more modified rapture about the potential of AI chatbots to answer thorny problems such as. How does brain activity result in brain experience? And he's not yet convinced about the publicly shared explanations from the makers of these tools about how they actually work. I'm interested to know what you what you think about the the apparently sudden appearance of this new generation of AI tools and platforms from the the very much uh, convergent rather than divergent thinking chat GPT to mid journey. Um, do they excite you? Do they terrify you? Do they, do they make you think we, we may um, have a sorcerer's apprentice that can help us to answer some of these big thorny problems? Um, I, I don't think they will help us to answer the thorny problems like <clears throat> how does brain activity result in subjective experience? Uh, for one thing, they themselves are dependent on the output of uh, the human mind beforehand, namely all that stuff that we've dumped onto the uh, internet that it's trained itself on. Um, so I, 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 I doubt it. Um, I'm at this point still puzzled, and I have to confess part of my puzzlement is that I'm dissatisfied with the explanations that are out there on how they work, and 
uh, when I have some time, I want to take a deep dive into the kind of the guts of these programs, just to answer the question of how are they, how are they accomplishing something that most of us would have said they, a system like that couldn't accomplish. That is, and I, I confess to being surprised, I think I'm not the only one, that they could put forth such coherent answers on pretty abstract uh, uh, tasks, paraphrasing, prose, summarizing, answering questions in a coherent way. Um, partly because perhaps this goes back to Amos Tversky's law of small numbers, that uh, perhaps we're, we're just not equipped to anticipate in our own mental simulations what a system that processes a petabyte of data and summarizes its regularities in a trillion parameters. What is a system like that capable of? More, certainly more than I thought. Uh, what's the trick? Where in those trillion um, uh, connection weights are, is there an understanding of the gist of a sentence or of a logical relationship between all and some? It's kind of buried in there somewhere. Um, how did it, how exactly did it get there? How does it get out? Um, uh, you know, I confess that my understanding is to, too superficial to be able to answer those questions. And until we do, there's a lot that we, we don't know. It's kind of a, almost an alien intelligence that we've got to study the way we study our own intelligence. It's not like ours in, in, in many ways, but it is, uh, you know, it does impress of things. And, and fascinating, the way, I mean, you're I, I mean, obviously completely right about, you know, it depends on what we've dumped on the internet and, 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 uh, and then uh, it then generates its own stuff that it uses in ways that it, it understands how it, how it uses them. Um, one of the things I found it to be particularly poor at doing in many different platforms is jokes, um, really bad, really hopeless at puns, really bad at that brilliant comic thing of the switcheroo. It seems to have, even though it's kind of, you know, it's got all of the, it's got all of the, the corpus of, of, of 20th, 20th and 21st century humor um, to draw on. Uh, it seems to be sing singly bad at doing that. That brilliant. I mean, I, I often think that that, um, uh, that the particularly the switcheroo when you're a comedian is taking you down uh, one line and then completely flips one eighty, and that's the that, that's the cause of the humor. Um, uh, I, I often think that that's kind of akin to to the human faculty of insight. Data really does have the potential to change our views of the world, and that's been evolving rapidly in the past thirty plus years. Here, two of this season's guests share their experiences. First, consultant liver doctor and health software pioneer Tim Jobson, and then another keen observation from Steve Pinker at Harvard. Is data very important to you and the work that you do? So yes, and yes for me personally as well, but it definitely has changed. So I qualified in medicine, it's over 30 years ago now. So 1992, it seems a long, long time ago. Um, and the bit of medicine that I really enjoy kind of reflects the career perhaps I should have had, which was as a detective inspector. So I love piecing things together. I love, uh, I, I'm told that I would to be very good at that job. So probably I'm in the right job, but piecing together bits of information to unravel a story, um, to solve a crime or to make a diagnosis is what drives me, is, what, is what's motivated me almost from day one, which is why I'm not maybe a surgeon. Maybe that, I mean, the hand-eye coordination bit, but you know, surgeons, the diagnosis is obvious. It's your skill in putting the pieces back together. If you're reassembling a broken bone or whatever, it's, it's the treatment. If you're an oncologist, it's, it's about treating, getting exactly the right combination of treatments for a known diagnosis. That's never driven me quite the same way as absolutely no idea what's wrong with this patient. What, what are you going to do? How do we put the bits together? So from that perspective, I've been a bit of a data processor my entire career. But I guess the question is, where do those bits of data come from? And obviously, unless you're kind of motivated by the data that is the patient story, you're never going to do this well. You're never going to enjoy medicine. So the, what the patient recounts, the history as we call it, these are my symptoms. This is where this is where it hurts is the simplest bit, but it's actually much more subtle and complex than that. And it's a big picture and it's a whole patient. So that's your kind of first data point in medicine, is all the information the patient gives you. And for a lot of people, that's of no interest. I want to see what the x-ray shows. 
show me the CT scan, and we'll tell you what's wrong, and then we'll fix it, and then we've done our job. But it's actually it's actually much broader than that. So that's the first bit of data, and then you can lay a hand, laying on of hands, and there's a therapeutic bit of that as well, just make them feel good, and then you can see, well, there's a big level there, or whatever, there's a big lump there, it's tender there. So there's more data there. But then you're starting to get into the tests, and you start to assemble those bits of information. And again, lots of people think of when we get to the testing bit of medicine, we'll put, we'll take a biopsy, or we'll do a scan, or we'll do a blood test, and there's your answer. We can look up the answer, we can tell you them, what's wrong with the patient. But even those very specific scientific tests, they don't actually give you an answer. They give you more data, they give you another data point, they give you a probability, if you like. Um, if you if you're into Bayes theorem, you, you this is the bit that you'll really enjoy about the you know, increasing likelihood of one answer over another. Uh, so that's that's the bit that drives me. That's the thinking that I really enjoy. And then you can start to to piece all, all bits together. And it'd be really dull if humans had been designed properly, because if they'd been designed properly, they'd have a little digital readout on the front. A bit like your dishwasher has what it says error code twenty four. You'd get what the hell's that? I could probably tell you it's blocked because that's probably the only thing that goes wrong with dishwashers. But you look up error code, you go, oh, right, okay, this is this is this is a blocked pipe in the heart. This is an and this is angina, so I know what to do about that. So you can do that. But we don't have that digital readout, we don't have that system. It would have been a much better design, but would of course put us at, uh, in my profession out of work. So um yeah. So it's assembling all the bits of data in an individual case that then yeah, that's interesting. That's exciting. But so where's it gone from there? It is I've done some research. So I did a PhD. That wasn't very data driven, to be honest, um, to start with. But I managed to push it in the data way, so that was good. Uh, we were looking doing expel, cells with exp, uh, experiments with cells in pots and trying to find out what makes them grow and survive, and and then go on to do other things. And it, it was some basic science, but there's a there's a data component to that, and then you've got to in biological experiments, you always got so much noise, you've got to look for, is this statistically a good answer we found? And so that's a, a kind of data-driven part of it. And then over time, I guess things have changed more because as a consultant, you're more responsible for a group of patients. You're responsible for a whole patch. So in our patch of West Somerset, it's not huge, 350,000 people, but there's only three of us with a special interest in our field. So between the three of us, we're kind of responsible for a much bigger proportion of patients. And some of that sits in the public health domain, and that's not what I do. Um, but a lot of it sits in, okay, we've got that many people out there with particular conditions. We need to set up our services, configure our services um, to treat those patients. So that's a kind of evolution of where data comes together. Um, and it links what's going in a population and whether you're starting with 350,000 in West Somerset or 7 billion, which is probably some well, it's, uh, some particular multiple, isn't it? But the sums are trickier with that number of nulls around, around the planet. <laughs> that's, your, that's, your, that's your population that you need to make make our lives a bit better if we can and use the data and use the information to do that. I, I was ahead of my time even in using computers because many people just use calculators. But you get a wide tractor feed uh, printout, you know, in, in all caps of, of your data. And the computers weren't even smart enough to convert a matrix of numbers into a graph. And so I had graph paper and, you know, colored pencils. And I remember just plotting the points, reading them out from the computer printout. And they kind of fell into this beautiful pattern, exactly as predicted by the theory. And that, that was a kind of moment of ecstasy that just cemented in me the desire to be someone who, who uses data. That the idea that, that the prospect that an abstract idea, whether you were right or wrong, could actually be seen in shapes and colors uh, was, was, was truly exhilarating. And, and ever since then, I've taken great pleasure in, especially when there's a difficult um, conceptualization problem. You're not sure what your data are telling you. you you've got you know, num matrix and tables of numbers, and then you figure out how to plot it in a way that shows what's going on. That kind of epiphany is a moment of, of, uh, of deep pleasure. But on, on top of that, so that's just my, my background. That's just why 
you know, why I'm not a philosopher, why I'm not an, uh, an artificial intelligence researcher. Data is part of the pleasure of, of, uh, of what I do. But also, and this connects to my two of my more recent books, Enlightenment Now and The Better Angels of Our Nature, it can change your view of the world, your view of human, human destiny. Uh, and in particular, in my case, uh, seeing um, graphs of measures of human well-being plotted out over time and seeing um, a number of bad things like violence going down. Now, I, we, you and I had a discussion as to what was the orientation of the, my image on the, the, uh, the, the screen because it's gone through several layers of processing, so I don't know which is left and which is right. Is, uh, am I, is this going uh, in the right direction from a graph, from left to right? Uh, it is going, uh, uh, having time, having time, yes, going that way, that is definitely going there. I'm seeing it mirror reverse, and that's, that's what I ask. Anyway, there are lots of graphs that look like that. Bad things going down, good things going up. Uh, violence, uh, child mortality, maternal mortality, number of countries with slavery, racism, um, child abuse, domestic violence. Graph after graph, when you plot it, it's going in in a, in a good direction. Uh, this was, for me, mind blowing because, um, for one thing, it overturns the kind of impression of the world that you get through uh, journalism and through history, uh, which is since it's those are a non-random sample of the worst things that are happening now or the worst things that happened in the past, the wars, the revolutions, the terrorist attacks, the uh, the, the epidemics. Uh, as long as those haven't gone to zero, there are plenty of them to fill your newsfeed or your history book. Um, whereas all the things that don't happen, like countries that aren't fighting wars or don't get attacked by terrorists, or the things that build up incrementally, a few percentage points a year, which then compound, are just invisible unless you're looking at data. And that matters in terms of you know, what have our species done? Have we just got made a bigger and bigger and bigger mess? Or have we actually pushed back against the forces of the universe that grind us down? So that's a big cosmic philosophical uh, understanding of you know, the cosmos and our place in it. And for me, it, it came from data. It couldn't have come from any other place. Yes, ma man doesn't bite dog, rarely sells a, a, a copy of the Boston Globe, does it? <laughs> Indeed. Steve Pinker there, revealing how observation and analysis of real-world data tell a rather different story on human progress than we get from either journalism or history. How data can lead to moments of ecstasy and really be truly exhilarating. Steed absolutely is the archetypal data malarkey guest. More from Tim and Steve now on the impact of data on our ability to get a more complete view of the world. First this time, Steve detailing the all too predictable long heralded mistakes that we make by using small sample sets when we're looking to make real world explanations about a population level. I think we should have known this a long time ago because Amos Tversky published a brilliant paper in 1970 called The Law of Small Numbers, Belief in the Law of Small Numbers. That was a kind of nerdy joke at play on the law of large numbers the law of small numbers being not a law of, of statistics, of course, but a law of psychology, which is that we humans tend to believe that a sample of any size is going to be representative of the population from which it's drawn. So we tend to underpower our studies. We tend to, uh, that's one of the reasons behind the notorious replicability failures. Um, the, uh, uh, and so I've been heartened that, you know, growing up in the, in the tradition of running, running, you know, 10, 15, 20, you know, maybe 30 subjects, uh, the revolution that allows you to sample data sets that uh, are the fruits of many other people's research. Uh, in the case of child language acquisition, which one of, was the other of my uh, early interests in uh, psychology, in the mid-80s, in a kind of precocious um, big data moment, uh, a number of um, my fellow psycholinguists digitized transcripts of children in conversation with their parents, sampled, say, an hour a week uh, over several years, and, uh, and, and um, amassed. One of my graduate advisors led one of those studies in the 60s, but he, only, he studied three kids. Uh, he was ahead of his time. 
But his data, together with people from all over the world, got amalgamated into something called the Child Language Data Exchange System. And that that revolutionized my life in the 19, back in the 1980s, when instead of 25 kids playing with ducks and bunnies, I could have you know, tens of thousands of sentences. And I published a number of papers of uh, analyzing the, the, the uh, trends in uh, uh, children's speech. Even then, um, it was... I, you know, I was hungry for more, and I actually wrote a grant proposal for something that I, we whimsic, whimsically called the Human Speech Home Project, which is to try to get, instead of an hour a week, to try to get like everything that a small number of children said uh, and that their parents said to them, uh, that is at least an order of magnitude more data. The, it was turned down. I didn't get the money for it, and I, I did other things, but that, that was my, my dream at the time. So that was one area in which data uh, just kind of changed my life. Next, a couple of jo observations from Tim Jobson before Sam Michelson from Five Blocks rounds things out with an analogy from Tim's profession of healthcare. Around about 2007-ish, we started no longer looking at bits of paper with the results and we saw them on the screen. And I don't think that makes actually much difference to how you think about it. But there's a little button you could press that would plot a chart out. And suddenly uh, we started looking at blood tests over time. And that probably didn't actually affect me dramatically for about 10 years, but it's obviously chipped away over time. I started to think differently. So whenever I see a patient now in clinic or go to see a ward consult, I'm looking at information over time. Hang on, they've accumulated all this damage to their liver. They had a papillomal blood test, which on any one day of the week would be meaningless. You're not going to die tomorrow. Nothing's going to go badly wrong. But the cumulative effect over 10, 20 years is really profound. So by seeing that data differently, we started to think differently about patients. So I expect most people living, uh, dealing with liver disease would have started to see that differently. The next things that came along were quite, in a quite short period of time, a number of individual patients where it was clear, we've missed a chip, we've missed a trick. They've now got an advanced problem. They've now got a liver cancer, they've got end-stage liver disease, and we could have done something about it a few years ago. And then the patients start joining in with that. So the patients say, but I've had this discussion about my liver test with other doctors, with my GP, five years, do you mean we could have diagnosed this? Five, we started talking about this seven years ago, eight years ago, nine years ago. I said, well, yes and no. So this isn't a mistake. This isn't like a, 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 a misdiagnosis in a sense. It's a totally different way of looking at your information. But now I can chart it out and I can show you. And I, I always, I'm often spinning the screen around in, in, in clinic to show people what it is that I'm looking at. So they become part of that. So then we started saying, well, hang on, this is probably true for lots. And there was a seminal moment where the clinical chemist, the clinical biochemist who was in charge of our lab, sent some data to a colleague because we were saying, we need to see these people. We need to get them into clinic. We need, we need to get them a little bit out of it. He said, you can't do that because there are so many of them. Oh, what do you mean so many? Well, we do, this was 2018 or so, we do 18,000 liver blood tests every month in Somerset in a little patch of, in primary care, in GP lab. So that's ignoring everything that's going on in hospital. And 2,000 of those every month are abnormal. And this equates to many thousands of individual patients each year being noted to have abnormal liver tests. So we couldn't possibly see them all in clinic. What would we do with this? So then start the pits of the, you see the bits of the jigsaw coming together. I'm thinking it's diagnoses that we could have made sooner. And that's very different from misdiagnoses, but it's important. It's the trends over time and the historical picture of what's been happening with these people's liver tests, their liver function tests, and a number of other blood tests. And it's the size of the problem. So we are not going to solve that. We're never going to solve that with our current processes. Our current processes, if your knee hurts, you go and see a GP. So my knee hurts and see a physio, and the physio does some exercise, doesn't work, you go back. Painkillers don't work, you get referred to a surgeon, you get a new knee and the problem's fixed. But it started with you going to your GP with a sore knee. But the liver's asymptomatic, there's no symptom to your liver. So you don't know. And the GP looking at one blood test can't see the picture at a time. So they don't. So who does know? So nobody really knows what's happening with this patient. But we could piece all those bits. If we could just get hold of that information, we could piece all those bits of information together. 
And that was really where we started with uh, the project. We started this Somerset Liver Improvement Project to start looking at the components. What are the things we had to bring together? We had to bring some data analysis. We had to re-engineer our clinical pathways so that people could be referred in different ways. So there's a whole a different work we had to do. And we had to create the capacity to see these patients. And that's all of that's still a work in progress. But part of that was generation of a way of looking at the data that we will be. The observation I made is a subtly different one. It's how I changed the way I thought just by looking at my own data in a different way and how that can be a very subtle thing over time. Probably something that's actually very difficult to control and plan for, but a really interesting observation because there's probably numerous examples of the way people have changed their approach to a problem because they've started to display the data in a regular on a regular basis, but in a different way. Um, and, and I think it'd be a fascinating area of research well beyond my capabilities, um, but it has huge implications. So how do we present finance data or political data or economic, you know, economic data to ourselves, to the population, on the news and so on? Is that going to actually change the way people think? about their lives and their economy and everything else. Um, and sometimes the lack of consistency about how we present data probably is just noise in the system. It's it's it, it's, the, it's very easy to present the data, change the axes around and be a bit manipulative at that stage. So that, that can then kind of create some noise in the system and make people think differently. Um, I think it's fascinating. It's a huge insight that I've had into my own brain and how my brain works. You're you're re you're referencing um, visualizing things in different ways. I'll put a, I'll include a link in the show notes. Makes me think of an early pioneer of data visualization and data com and data storytelling in healthcare, being one Florence Nightingale and the way that she uh, identified what was going on in field hospitals. Those amazing circular uh, charts that eventually got Queen Victoria to invest quite significantly in in changing healthcare practice. And the goal is not to learn from that analysis how I can how I can fool Google or, or trick Google. The goal is to understand what is happening um, and what might be the cause of issues. And not, not dissimilar from the way that a, a, that a medical professional would look at do a blood tests or different types of tests and look at a bunch of different factors and say, oh, this one seems a bit off. This one seems a little different. When I compare this to the population, um, I notice these, these things tend to go together. So we can develop these kind of patterns and understanding and all of that leads to um, actually, I think the most interesting thing is taking emotion out of the equation when it comes to um, digital reputation management. And this is a very emotional issue when, it, when you're talking about an executive, someone is saying something uh, unpleasant about them. But it's also true for a company. If someone is negative about a brand, um, I have been sometimes surprised by how personally the people who work on that brand, um, even if it's a for a large multinational company with tens of thousands of employees, if when something bad is said, they, they're they implying that the kind of people that work here wouldn't have good values. That's hurtful to all of the people who work there. And it's, um, and it's you know, sometimes surprising because it's like, wow, what's a, what's a, you know, it's a brand. It's not you. But people who identify with brands when they work uh, internally, and obviously it has, obviously there's, there's, um, there's financial reasons why this could be important. There's legal reasons. But um, when we can take, the emotion out of it a little bit and move over to the data. What is the data actually telling us? Why is this Why is this story from three months ago still so prominent? What is it? Is it answering a question that people are asking? Is it satisfying searchers? Why is Google think it is if it's not? You know, so the, those are all ways in which we use data to, uh, you know, to provide, like, I think a different type of service. The digital advertising market has been murky and swamp-like for the past 20 years. Stein Jambrera, Founder and MD of Media Futures Market has developed a platform to connect buyers, that's brands and their agencies, with high quality media owners and publishers selling advertising inventory. But although this is very much a business to business product and play, Stein and his team have built their platform using business to consumer principles B2C, not B2B, to deliver a warm, human, easily understood customer experience. This approach exemplifies several of the other principles we covered in Season 2 and earlier in this Greatest Hits episode, particularly being wary of and avoiding 
the curse of knowledge. One thing I wanted to ask, actually, I, I, I forgot to ask you before, in terms of the usability of the, of the products and services that you're producing at Media Futures Market, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I presume, tell me if I'm wrong, I presume you're applying the principles of kind of brilliant um, online experience that things should never be more than a couple of clicks away, that you're not having to send people down endless rabbit, rabbit warrens. <laughs> Are you using those kind of principles? Yeah, so th there are a couple of principles uh, we we would like to attain and, and like to reach within the platforms. Like you always should be three clicks from magic. Um, uh, but even some people say, well, if if we are ten, ten clicks from magic, it's already uh, quite quite awesome to reach that stage. So it really depends also on the on on how uh complex the business is so what we are trying to do is make it uh more easy to understand to lower the barriers so if you do that uh i think uh it's, it's very uh logic that you uh decrease the steps you need to take to uh yeah to get the result so we are going from maybe uh you used to have 10 steps and now we want to go to three uh, uh, so that's the goal we have to make media um, easier to understand and easier to buy for uh, a lot of um, a lot of players in the market so uh, I think that's fairly important and always to keep in mind because users of the platform even it's even uh, if it's b2b they're also customers they are they are normally they're shopping for uh, new trousers uh, and then they also want to have a fluent uh, onboarding or, or log in it should be all wor working very fine and then if it's b2b uh, sometimes people think well then it should be very hard to uh, reach a certain platform or to log in uh, very weird ways of uh, of doing that but uh, in in my opinion it should be the same experience as a yeah, as, as an e-commerce uh, experience, because we are all customers. We started with the Harvard psychologist, Steven Pinker. We end with Echometric CEO, Jean-Baptiste Bouzige, reflecting on the wisdom he gleaned from Pinker's opposite number at Princeton, Daniel Kahneman, when Kahneman was Bouzige's guest on the Echometrics podcast. The two greatest living psychologists bookending this episode of Data malarkey. Last year, you interviewed the Princeton psychologist Daniel Kahneman on how difficult it is to persuade individuals and companies to tackle climate change, the, the way that we we discount the long-term future. How was that? <laughs> to be honest, it was my dream. So, so, so when we when we built the event with uh, with uh, PR agency, uh, we we made a list of uh, potential speakers, and, and I told them my dream would be to have. Uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman. So it, it was really great because my comic economics and microeconomics or behavioral economics are hugely important in the process as described because um, uh, I often say, and sometimes maybe my data scientists will tell you that I, I often say exactly the same thing, that they, they are bored with that, but a good model, you should be able to draw that on a one page. You need to conceptualize. And that was a, a kind of a battle a few years ago when data science starts to st started to replace statistics. I had suddenly I had people telling me, I don't have to make choices. I can I can write a code to test all the combination. And I, I I had to explain them that to make a difference, we need to make choices. We need our own editorial line. We need to to, to know the question we ask. I don't believe that you can find something without knowing what you're looking for. And for that, economics is so interesting because you have a lot of frameworks that are allowing you to draw on a one-pager the question you ask yourself and how to turn that in analytical words. If you, if you do pricing, if you, if you know the uh, theory of uh, utility, it's really, really important. If you do personalization, behavioral economics is hugely important. And that's a way that you break down your decision making, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, at, so that was a dream because that was really the, at the crossing of something really technical and, and also at being inspired. 
and Daniel Kahneman is, is so so kind actually. He spends so much time you um, yeah explain uh, thinking about your question even if it's uh, hundreds he has earned that for for so many times etc and spend time to to think about it and 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 being really in the discussion it was a it was a really nice moment and and uh, having breakfast with him and the team before uh, uh, before uh, shooting the, the interview was was probably one of the best moments of my career uh, because you have something about transmission you know I know that the word in English is not exactly the same it's <laughs> but uh, it's um, it's uh, yeah a good moment. So there we have it. Season two is a wrap. We'll be right back with season three from the 27th of September until we have a glittering array of guests for you. From the worlds of screenwriting, diversity and inclusion and forensic science, from market research, digital marketing and AI. Women and men are the top of their game whose common approaches to using data smarter in radically different roles and environments have lessons for us all whatever roles we fulfill in the ever-evolving knowledge economy. As ever, any suggestions you have for guests, if you think you make a good, good, good guest, or if you know or work with someone who tell a great story about how they make smarter use of data, well, do drop us an email at hello at usingdatasmarter.com or complete the application form at https colon backslash backslash www dot using data smarter dot com slash guest. I look forward to welcoming you back for more data common sense in the near future. With the Data Malarkey podcast dropping every other Wednesday on Apple, Spotify and Google podcasts and video episodes going live on our YouTube channel at Data Malarkey a week later. See you there. Thanks so much for listening to Data Malarkey the podcast about using data smarter. To find out what kind of data storyteller you are, why not take our data storytelling scorecard? It takes just two minutes to complete and we'll give you a personalized report right away. Visit data-storytelling.scoreapp.com or follow the link in the show notes.